All right, let's see if this works. Hopefully you can see me okay. Hey guys, how you all doing? Can you hear me and see me okay? I'll stop playing for a minute and see what you guys say. Hoping that it looks okay and it sounds okay. Hey guys, we've got three people watching. All right. Thanks guys for uh, hanging out with me today. I'm in an ACDC moment right now. I don't know what happened. Well, I know what happened. I listened to them last night a little bit. And uh, yeah, they got the coolest riffs, don't they? East of Easy Rocks. If you want blood, you got it. All right. So, how y'all doing? I am having some coffee in my nice mug. Look at that. You can order one of, just like this if you would like to have the best tasting coffee ever. Get one of these. You can order it uh, from my, uh, my merchandise website, cafepress.ca slash Master Guitar Academy. Cheers. I got a ton of stuff there, like like this shirt that you mm, may see. If I turn around a little bit like this, look at that. You gotta have one of these for your friends. Give it to your best buddy. Or get one for yourself. So I am playing um, my Sir Strat, Sir. Well, I guess not. Can't call it a strat, but it's very much like a strat. Um, this is probably my favorite guitar. It's so comfortable to play and it sounds great. And today I'm playing through my XFX by Fractal Audio, which is uh, a unit I've had for well over a year at least, and it's it's become my, my staple tool for recording because it just sounds so nice and there's so much, so many good tones in it. Um, but I really do love uh, playing through tube amps when I have a chance, especially if I play a gig. And um, so I thought I'd mention a little bit in the beginning here about, well, first of all, I should mention that um, I've been running a YouTube membership thing now for a while, which is a, a, a service that YouTube started where you can join a creator like myself and um, you get some perks with that. And the cost is about $5 per month. And that's what you see 
in my two minute lessons that I've been putting out since November. I think I started in November. And every Friday morning, you get a new lesson, two minutes long, and, it, and that's free for everybody. But if you are a member of my YouTube uh, channel, you also get a jam track for every single one of these two minute lessons. Every Friday, a new jam track for you, plus, of course, the tablature and notation for the lesson I'm teaching. So it's only five bucks per month, so that's one way you can support what I'm doing. And you also get uh, these different um, emojis that you can use in the chat right now. So that will highlight that you are a member of my YouTube channel. Okay? Um, and, oh, let me tell you about a few other things. I got a story to tell you that is, well, kind of interesting, I'm hoping. So, let's see if I can show you here. It's hard to see because of the light, it's so bright. Uh, let's see if I, I got pics. That was a bag of pics, let me show you one. If I hold it like this, maybe you can see. Yeah, look at that. Master Guitar Academy, just like my shirt and just like my coffee mug. I got a bit of a branding thing going on here. So these are pics with my logo on both sides. And they come in two thicknesses. This one is uh, 0 0.4, no, 71 millimeters. And I really like this one for strumming, funky stuff. It's my favorite one for that. So I or also ordered uh, a another kind, a thicker one, which is 1.2 millimeters, which is uh, a thickness that I like to use. And it looks like, like so. But there is a major problem with these picks. And I, I don't know what to do with them. I'll show you. I have a whole bag full of them somewhere. Yeah, here. Oops. So, what's the problem with these picks? Well, so I ordered these picks and I got them from China, of course. All the, a lot of stuff is made there, right? So it's affordable. Uh, so I figured, well, let's give them a try. And the white picks turn out awesome. But these ones, they didn't tell me this in advance, but they, in order to print my logo on a black pick, uh, they decided they should take white picks and paint them black. They painted the pick black and then they printed my logo. What do you think will happen when you play with this pick? As you, you know, scrape and strum, the pick goes up and down the strings. What will happen to that paint? It's hard, you can't maybe see, but of course, <laughs> it wears off. So the, the, the black paint on the side of this of this of all these picks it just falls off as soon as you play so terrible pretty worthless but um i got a whole bag full of them I'm not sure what I, maybe i should do some artwork create something cool <laughs> i don't know but i ordered another uh, batch of, of this white kind and um they should be here soon and that's the uh, uh, 1.2 millimeter so they should be available soon so anyway i just uh I wanted to try that and I'm going to give some away to people who join my website. So that's another thing you can do to support me if you want to learn from me. MasterGuitarAcademy.com. Uh, if you join I'll, uh, for a year, it's only 30, like 36 cents per day if you, if you pay for one year in advance. Then I'll send you one of each. Okay? 1.2 millimeter and 0.71 uh, millimeters. Another pick that I really like that's also new is this one see if I can show you this this is from hell parts my friend Michael makes these picks and they have you can see the the uh, ridges here and it's got like a thumb imprint that fits your thumb nicely so it guys it has these uh, grooves in it so it you can hold it really securely when you play and these ones are a little bit thicker, I think 1.5 millimeter maybe. And because of the shape, a little bit rounded, a little bit bigger. I really like them. This is the standard size, the one I have made up with my logo. You see how the shape is different and the size is different. 
So that's another one that's really cool. You can check them out at hellparts.com. <laughs> And uh, while I'm talking about, let's talk about gear for a bit before we get into playing and questions. Um, that same company, Hell Parts, they make also really cool designs. Here's an example. This is a uh, pickup switch ring, I think they call it. You know, in the Les Paul, you have the pickup switch here, so you can, there's like the washer, another word for it maybe, washer. So you put that and then you tighten that thing so you can um, look cool when you play your Les Paul or similar guitar and the same for uh, truss rod covers there's a whole bunch of these he sells it ma he makes really cool designs hard to show without it being too bright there we go maybe this is one with a skull on it so that goes on the up there on a Les Paul Gibson style guitar yeah, there's some, uh, some things to check out. And um, yeah, I was talking about my XFX. XFX from, uh, from Fractal Audio. Oh, thank you, uh, Corey Edmonds. New member. Awesome. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, Corey. Um, so when I don't use the digital stuff, because that's the digital modeling thing, sounds great. Uh, but you know the thump and the and the feel you get from a good tube amp is unsurpassed, right? So I have a few tube amps. I like um, I kind of like Fender amps, but uh, I have a, a Fender Pro Junior from the '80s. It sounds great. I like that one a lot. I also have a Sir Badger, which is a phenomenal amp, um, and I have a Marshall JTM50, like a Plexi Marshall, which is really cool too. So I like to use some fairly half clean, half dirty amps, and then I can control the amount of grit and gain with my volume knob on the guitar. Um, so what about pedals? Well, I'll show you a few that I like to use. We'll start with this one. The Dude by Rocket. J Rocket Audio Designs. This is a really cool pedal. It's it's got that uh, Robin Ford in a pedal type of sound. I get that's what they say. Many people say that, but I find it's versatile. You can use it for high gain lead stuff, and you can use it as a boost as well. And it has really nice kind of a dumbly tone in it. I like it a lot. Great pedal. And as a general generic kind of um, semi-dirty overdrive pedal I use this one 12th Street special and this one I have some input on actually made by KO amps in Toronto this is a really good one it uh, it doesn't sound like a tube screamer it's more like a Timmy style pedal it doesn't color your tone too much but uh, it's it's very basic and it it sounds great so that one I like a lot uh, another overdrive pedal that's really great is this one from Luna Stone from Denmark. It get, looks really white again, doesn't it? Let me move it back. Because my white shirt, it gets whitish. You can't read it, read the lettering on it so well. I don't know. Maybe if I put my hand around it or something. Is that better? Oh, it's hard to show. Anyway, it says True Overdrive 1 on it. It's a, it's a really nice uh, pedal. It, it, uh, to me, it's a bit of a plexi tone in it. It's got that little bit of um, presence in it, you know, that little bit of brightness, a little bit of top end that's really shimmery and cool. Uh, another pedal that's awesome is, is this one, which is a boost pedal, the RC Booster. And if you look closely, if you're a fan of Scott Henderson like I am, hopefully you can see it's his signature pedal this one is a bit old he, he has a newer one out now but these pedals are great they have a bit of gain and they, they also have a treble and bass knob and then there's volume and gain and it doesn't have a lot of gain since it's a boost pedal 
but uh, it has a bit of headroom and you can if you have an amp that's a little bit of gain on if you turn if you use this pedal and turn up the gain on this pedal you get a nice nice overdrive naturally sounds really natural so that's a good one um, let's see oh yeah someone asking have you ever played v picks yo absolutely i have a bunch of v picks i i know vinnie smith really well i met him a couple times and he makes great picks and he he sent me a few of these to try out and his picks are great too i use them as well so there's three picks i use my own the hell super blacks and the hell i think he called it the jazz pick the one i showed you from hell parts and then uh, V picks. Those are three kinds of picks that I use. Um, okay, let me show you one more pedal or two more pedals. Let me show you this one, which I haven't tried yet very much, but this is also from uh, KO Amps in Toronto. Check them out, koamps.com. This is a delay pedal, Creature from the Black Lagoon. Really sweet. It's a bit of, well, I'm, I need to play with it more, but it has chorus vibrato uh, option on there and uh, modulation and it's a bit like the what is it called uh, the electro harmonics famous I uh, can't remember can't remember right now but I think you know what I mean uh, it's a sweet delay pedal lots of options in it very natural sounding and then the last pedal I'll show you is this one, which I find is really useful. This is the Super Ego by Electro Harmonics. And this is, well, it says Synth Engine on it. And um, I got cat hair on it <laughs> or something. We had five cats here, so that happens a lot. But this one I use mostly for one feature, which is holding your chord whatever you play and you press the button it will hold it forever they have another pedal called freeze and this is this one provides the same feature but um, it also has this synth engine so you can create some cool cool sounds with it as well so that's a really good pedal for practicing so you play a chord and then you can play scales and licks over it and then you because this one will hold your chord and it's hold down the button or you can set it to different options so that you push it down, it will keep that chord until you push it again. Uh, or just hold it like a latch. That's another way. As soon as you let go, it stops. So you play one chord, press the, uh, the switch, holds the chord, and then you solo, you play, play your legs and scales, go to a different chord, and press the, the switch, and it'll hold that. Great thing for, for practicing. Um, so let's have a sip of coffee actually, I actually drink fake coffee by the way I don't like to drink coffee at night because I can't sleep so I, I use something called what is it called calf lib or something it's uh, fake coffee with with um, chicory root and beetroot and things like that really nice doesn't taste like coffee but kind of in that vein I add some cream to it and sweet all right so you can still hear me fine I hope um, is the balance between my voice and my plane okay I don't know if the volume differences are between the difference between my speaking voice and the guitar is okay is hard to play cool song David Bowie all right so what else can I tell you well I also can tell you that I'm working on jazz blues a lot of people have asked me about that and the time has come for me to try and make a good course about how to play jazz blues which is a different style than 
you know, blues rock and the, the, the old style of electric guitar blues. When you play jazz blues, you have a different approach and you use a lot more tones for color, you know, uh, scales and arpeggios and concepts. There's a lot more theory that you can use. So um, I have started uh, devel uh, developing this course and I've created a bunch of uh, uh, exercises and videos for how to play the chords because you really got to know the chord progression. And next thing coming now very soon is how to solo and improvise when you play jazz blues. So that's available for members on my website and it's going to be a standalone course eventually as well once I have it ready. Okay, so let's see what else can we tell you. So you guys really enjoy the two-minute lessons. That's awesome. I see people commenting on that. Well, it's good to hear. And I am assuming that if you are somewhat accomplished already, and I'm sure many of you are great players, you don't need the tablature or the jam track. But you know, it's a, one way you can support what I'm doing. I put in a lot of work on these two-minute lessons, as I hope you can tell. Um, it's not just producing a lesson, because I have to think up something cool to show you too, something useful. So I try to make them like intermediate level. Uh, perhaps I should make more beginner level lessons on there. We'll see. I, I use it as a testing, you know, testing testing platform almost. Um, so next uh, next Friday there will be um, a jazz lick that you'll learn, which is going to use some more exotic notes in there. So I'm going to go towards more of jazz stuff this year, and we'll see how people react. I know not everyone likes to play jazz, but I can tell you, people ask me quite often what I did to develop the the style of my playing. And that, that's a good question. Maybe I should uh, talk about that a little bit. You know, I started out as playing. I started out. What did I start out playing? I, I was starting when I was 13 years old, and I, I got into Kiss, and uh, Zeppelin, and. Black Sabbath, Iron Maiden, um, Deep Purple, of course, you know, those kind of bands. And then after a while, I got into, I wanted to play a classical guitar. I tried to do that. I really liked that. And I was not very good with my finger picking. And then I got into the Beatles. I tried to learn a bunch of songs from them. So I never had any training initially. I just went with the, my ear. So I have developed a decent ear. Um, and then I got into pop music and funk and that kind of thing and then eventually I found jazz music. I heard Chicory Electric Band when I was maybe 19 and it was live and I couldn't believe what I heard. Like what? I heard how advanced it was and how flawlessly they were playing. Like this can't be live. This, this sounds like programmed almost. Like it's so perfect. And then I realized, oh, this is what I got to focus on because I want to be able to have that type of freedom musically as these guys seem to have. So then I studied jazz for quite a while and I learned all the theory and all this, you know, there's a lot of theory concepts that you get into once you dig into the world of jazz. So I studied that for quite a while and then I gradually have started, started to uh, apply those types of ideas from jazz music into my own playing. Um, I don't know if you can hear that because I don't always do it, but when I practice myself, I do more of that outside exotic scales and cool ideas. So that's a, a good one. If you if you are a player who played blues and rock for many, many years and you feel like, I don't know what I should focus on to get a diff to get more ideas in my playing, then I will tell you that jazz is a really good thing to study. And the thing is that you don't have to play with a big jazz box and this this round, dark, mellow tone, super clean. 
you don't have to play that way. You can still use the concepts of jazz, of jazz music and, and uh, play electric with a ton of gain. That's fine. You can do that. There's no, there are no rules. You take concepts that you, that you like and then you apply it to your own preference, to your own style, whatever you want to play. It's okay. You don't have to get permission from anyone. Follow your own voice. That's really important. All right. So that's an answer to Arif there. He asked me what my daily practice schedule is like and what helped me a lot in my playing. And that's, you know, that's learning triads, arpeggios all over the neck, scales, being able to go in and out of scales and modes and that kind of thing. That gives you freedom. It doesn't mean that you have to play like that all the time. But knowledge is good, right? Knowledge, not just in your head, because you have to transfer it onto the fretboard. So, um, learning enough stuff from a variety of sources, and it doesn't have to be just jazz music. I also highly recommend classical music and uh, other styles of music that you may not have touched on. Funk, R&B, Hendrix, pop music. Um, I'm a big fan of Prince, for example. So I take pieces of all these different styles of music and try to um, make it part of my own playing somehow. All right. So let's see what should we do next. Um, well, I wanted to talk a little bit about practicing and getting better, and you can hopefully see that I, I wrote them down in the in the description box under the video. So. Uh, the first thing I want to tell you is you should keep a practice diary or a practice, uh, a lick line practice uh, diary or library. So that what I mean by that is I, I often sit late evenings when I not ready to go to bed, but I want to practice a bit of guitar. So when I practice guitar, I don't sit and go. You know, I don't just sit and play the pentatonic up and down because I already know that. I don't really need to do that. What I practice is coming up with some interesting lines. Those are a little bit more, there's a bit more work in playing those lines that I did now compared to the pentatonic up and down. It's a big difference, right? So, so I sit down and take my time. I use a metronome or drum track. Oh, by, by the way, before I forget, I just loaded up a website somewhere with a free, uh, a free drum machine. And I recommend you you try uh, you you check it out. It's called Drumbit. Drumbit dot app. I don't know if you can hear it if I play it. Let's see. Uh, I'll put it in this description of the video here at the bottom. Drumbit dot app. A P P. And it's a free drum machine that you can load up presets and uh, or you can click in yourself. It's a really good thing to learn a little bit of basics of, of how to program drums. Can you hear that? You 
know, I sit and noodle around stuff like that. And then I think, okay, I come, I come up with some cool line. Then I take the time and... Okay, that sounds cool. And then I'll go over and over until I find, okay, this, this one sits well under my fingers and it sounds cool. Now, the problem is if I don't write that down, I will not remember it tomorrow. So then I use Guitar Pro, which is a great program for doing these things. You bring up Guitar Pro, open a new file, and then you have a, you have a um, fretboard viewer where you just click on an idea. And I do that almost every day. And then I go over it on, on a regular basis because you need to go back and look at it, at it and otherwise you'll forget. So the next day I go back and try to play that again. Let's see if I can do it. You know, stuff like that. And then I find something that sounds cool, I write it down. And then next day, next evening before bed, I might find a whole different kind of groove and then I sit and come up with something then. And then I practiced enough that it flows under my fingers and I can use it in a, in a song, right? I know it right then, but I know next day or the day after, I will not remember it. So I have to write it down. So that's really important. Otherwise, if you, if you come up with these cool ideas and, oh, this is a co cool thing and it sounds great, if you don't write it down, it's very likely that you will not remember it. So it's like wasting your time almost. So that's number one. Keep a, uh, a lick diary, lick, line, whatever you're practicing, a cool way to practice scale, whatever. Even chords, of course, chord voicings and chord ideas. Write all that stuff down and then you look at it every month, maybe even every week ideally every week, as, as often as you can. And eventually you're going to go through those licks and okay, I, I remember like 80% of it. And then the newest stuff in there, you're going to be like, oh, how did I do this again? And you have to relearn it. And relearning it is going to wire it better in your brain, right? So uh, that's number one. Okay, I'll, I'll take some questions as I see them come by before we go to the next tip. Uh, George Benson riffs. I don't know too many. I I really like George Benson, but I I'm not in George Benson mode right now. I have to sit and practice and come up with something. Um, slow bends with and without vibrato. Yeah, bends are important. <laughs> That and those are, I guess, technique exercises, uh, technique practice. I I do that too. You know, trying to use bends as a really emotional, powerful uh, tool because they they really are and. Um, I really should make a course on, on uh, bending, and I have thought about it, and I, I think I will. Give, to give the people uh, exercises and uh, information for how you can use bends to convey emotion and, and feeling, right? And it's not just blues where you use bends. You, you can use it in any style of music. Yeah. Uh, what else? I'll take some more questions while we're here. Oh, a lot of questions. I have to scroll. Hang on a second. Let's have a have a drink. Um, yeah, there. I have some jazz uh, fans here. I see. Jazz is cool. I like all sorts of jazz, but I like the older stuff the most. Uh, um, older, like 
mutazamin. Well, I like I like the guys guys who really swing. Like uh, I'm a big fan of Oscar Peterson. So the 1940s and the 50s are probably my my favorite jazz era. But then on the other hand, I like Louis Armstrong, and he started. The, when did he start? In the tens or early twenties or something? I like that kind of thing too, because he was such a great player, phenomenal musician. Um, chicken picking, yeah, I do that. You know, guy like me, you probably know I'm a jack of all trades. I play different styles, and I I teach predominantly. I don't gig so much anymore. And I play since I play different styles. I I have to practice different styles. So sometimes, okay, I want to work on some some country stuff. Like I did that. Uh, can't even play it anymore. I forgot it. And the Albert Lee lick a while back. When I get into a mode like that in my brain, trying to learn a, a new thing, this might, might be a different style that I haven't been doing so much, then I have to sit down and practice. And that's the same with chicken picking. Sometimes I do that. I'm not very good at it right now, but, and I have the, right, the wrong tone, but. But yeah, I do that sometime. Sometimes I, uh, I, I, I play, uh, I practice doing the, the snapping with my finger. You know, that creates that cool sound. That's a cool technique to practice. You guys get have to get used to using both the middle finger and the ring finger to pluck up the strings. Yeah. So, what else do we have? Uh, yeah, Ben's course. I need to do that. I have a course on my broad already. Um, it's available on my website. My broad is also really important. There's so many styles of vibrato. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, my jazz blues course, uh, Freddie Green style comping is what I have done so far, and I'm gonna add some more um, examples and uh, and practice videos for how to play rhythm when you play jazz blues. And it's gonna be more and more chord voicings coming in and so on. And I, you know, I don't know if you, if anyone knows really that I actually have a if I may say so, a pretty vast knowledge of harmony and theory, in, including chord voicings and um, more complex chords. And I like to explore those things in my, my late evening practice. And then when I find some really cool voicings, guess what I do? I write, it, I write them down in my, in my um, diary. Um, so, Maybe you can tell me, are you interested in learning more about uh, those types of chords where you have, you know, sharps and flats in there, where you have uh, major nine chords, sharp 11, you know, all that kind of stuff. I, I, I could make more lessons on those topics, but I, I think that le fewer people would be interested. But of course, it's fun, so maybe I'll try to do more of that kind of thing. Uh, harmony is something that really fascinates me. 
I like to listen to bands like a Weather Report because Joe Zawinul, he was a phenomenal musician and I really like his chord progressions and sometimes they're really complex and, and fascinating. So, uh, yeah, I might do more lessons and examples of cool chord voicings and try to explain it. The problem is it can quickly be confusing if you don't have enough theory knowledge and I start to talk about sh sharps and flats and intervals and all this stuff that it could go over the head but hey we've got to start somewhere right if if that's too complex for some people maybe they can look at those videos once they have learned more I don't know you tell me what do you think um, I mean most of the time I, I I think that uh, you want to have fun when you're playing so if you have fun playing complex things fun playing simple things it doesn't matter it's all just as valid you enjoy playing that's what why we do it right we have fun with it for very few of us it's a way of making a living but in the end it has to be fun and rewarding personally otherwise why do it right and and another thing I want to say about that is making it more complex and uh, weird uh, as well as fast and impressive doesn't necessarily make it better right there's I know there's a huge following for this uh, this shred thing where people play so many notes so fast and then it's impressive and all that but for me it's more like it becomes a sport almost who can play the fastest and more most who, who can do the most complex things and I don't want to watch sports when I when I'm playing music or listening to people play. I want to hear good, for me, interesting ideas, and it doesn't have to be fast. It can be fast doesn't mean it's bad, but but if if this fast stuff and impressive stuff is made only to impress and it doesn't have a musical, you know, for me value, then I don't really dig it. So, but there are some people that are really great at doing both, like. Uh, Tom Quayle, for example, he is really amazing. Uh, Martin Miller, this German guy, he is really f phenomenal too. And my, my buddy Camilo Valandia, check him out. Camilo Valandia, he is phenomenal. I can't play like those guys, but I can appreciate what they're doing. All right. Uh, let's take some questions again. Do I perform live? Sometimes when... I sometimes do one-man shows when I use the looper pedal or backing tracks and just kind of jam, or jam along to some grooves or some jazz standards or some blues tunes, whatever. I don't have a band right now, but that may be changing. We'll see. Might be a power trio coming, playing some rock and blues and fusion stuff. We'll see. Um... Uh, good chord progressions for practicing natural harmonic and melodic minor. Uh, that's kind of an in-depth uh, question. Uh, I would start by just using one chord. And this is where a pedal like this is phenomenally... Is that a word? Phenomenally. It's very useful. You can just hold that chord, create whatever voicing you want, let it ring, and then you practice. Or you can do this, you can use the low E string. Practice the natural minor. And then you go to harmonic minor. minor you know that works too 
for chord progressions, you would have to look at harmonizing each of those modes, which is a, I won't have time to show you that right now, but uh, trust your ears. But just for a chord, when you, you can play all those three minor scales over a, a regular minor chord. Next question. Yeah, when it comes to chords and advanced harmony and stuff like that, it's you'd really need to study some theory in a, from a jazz book, so you get the concept theoretically, and then you have to practice applying it to the fretboard, and that's usually more work, because it's not that complicated really to understand music theory. It's just kind of a logical thing and if you don't apply it into music quickly it gets boring and dry and you don't quite get what's the point of all, all this information right so we want to apply it as soon as possible um, yeah learning to set up your own guitar that's definitely um, a good thing to do I do, I said uh, uh, the action and neck adjustments, truss rod adjustments, uh, I do all that on my guitars. I, the only thing I don't do is to change the nut because I'm terrified of wrecking the, the, the fretboard. <laughs> but um, the, it does happen on my guitars that I, I get some, some string too low or something or the, the, the slot is too wide and I hear buzzing and stuff and then I take it to a, a luthier. But it's good to learn how to, to do basic things like setting your action and intonation too. So you can um, learn how to move the saddles so that they, uh, you get the most uh, intonated guitar as possible. Stays in tune all over the neck, hopefully, then, as you play chords. Um, yeah. So let's move on to number two. Tips for getting better. So I talked about uh, the chord and the lick library or diary where you develop an ongoing for the rest of your life. And I, you can use a notebook. You can write it down if you can write very well. I can't do that so well. So I use Guitar Pro. I use whatever tool you have. You can also record them. You don't have to use the software. You can just record into your computer or your phone or whatever. You play it and you listen back to it later. That works too. But the point is to not forget about it. All right, number two is to practice scales or all of the neck. That's something I always do every day. <laughs> um, but I don't play as I, I don't play the pentatonic up and down in one box because I know that, right? So I I look for voice, uh, not voicings, like fingering for different scales. Let's take that. Uh, melodic minor again e melodic minor i find a way to put my fingers and that this is just by exploration there's no right or wrong way to do this but you you take the time you can have a fretboard diagram or whatever you need to, to see where the notes are. And then you figure out what's, what's the easiest way for you to play those notes. Like for me, I don't always play three notes per string. Sometimes I just play two. Sometimes I play four. You know, it, it's just a matter of what works for you, for your fingers. And that's something that's worth practicing. You sit down and you don't think about what's the right way to play this. No, you think, what's the right way for me to play that? It might be different for you. You might, don't, you might not like playing it the way I do here. You know, 
just explore it and see what works for you. But as I get used to these notes, I, I practice playing up and down the neck, not just in one position. So I might be playing. <laughs> And I try to make little melodies, right? To make some cool ideas happening. Up and down the neck. I stay, stay here for a while, I stay here for a while, stay there for a while, and then I try to connect them. And just by experimentation. And if I find some, some useful licks or Id ideas coming out of that, some lines, then I write it down, as I mentioned in tip number one. The third one is timing. Uh, use that uh, drum machine, and by the way, this is just one of many out there. Can you hear the drum machine? practice too something like that to come up with some nice rhythmic phrasing da 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 to be in the pocket and focus on the rhythmic aspects not so much the notes just be better at playing in time that's important to do on a regular basis okay that's number three and that works with strumming stuff too and and uh, chords and Stuff like that, Prince Funk. Well, I didn't have a very clean tone, but you get the idea. I'm trying to lock into the groove and listen to what I'm doing carefully so I can hear if my timing is sloppy. You gotta work on that frequently. And if you can't use the drum machine like that, use a metronome. That works too. Just a helper to. Uh, and there's a lot of things you can do with a metronome. You can put it to set the beat to two and four. One, two, four. And then you have to feel where the one and three is. And then you can you start removing the click here and there. But it'll help you become more uh, uh, solid and more um, in tune with your t internal time. Okay. Questions? When playing a riff in a country song in G, can you stay on the G pentatonic like you can in blues? Or do you need to change the scale to match the chord changes? Um, well, you know, that depends on the tune, I guess. I mean, you can use the pentatonic and the blues scale, the minor pentatonic. Over, a, if it's just G major, you can still use it. If you do it the right way. Or you can use the major pentatonic. I mean, there's lots of options, right? You have to trust your ear and, and try to play something that fits the style of the song. 
Uh, when I play country stuff, I, I actually use a lot of jazz things, you know. A bit of chromatic stuff. That wasn't country, was it? <laughs> it was blues. Uh, yeah, but um, if you listen to guys like Albert Lee, they, he... Uh, mm. That lick I showed. Mm. There's chromatic notes in there. It's sort of jazz mixed in to country, and that's, that's cool. Um, usually it tends to have a major sound to it. Then you use that chicken picking stuff too. Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but you got to trust your ear. Listen to what other players are playing over a tune like that and see what you think fits. You know, I just follow my instincts when I play. Um, sometimes playing the minor scale over major chord can sound really bad if you do it the, the wrong way. Sometimes it can sound cool. I would not play any major scale over a minor chord, however, because that will usually sound bad. But the blue scale, the minor blue scale, you know. That works over almost anything, especially if you bend that um, or include both the minor and the major. You can use it over almost any chord. The most universal scale ever is what I call the minor blue scale. Um, fingers, I'm, I don't have long fingers, I think I average size fingers, but it's, you know, you can still play great without having super long fingers. It's all about how you hold your hand. You don't want to be cramping it, you want to be putting your thumb further down be behind the neck and think of it more like a pivot motion and let your this part of your hand come down a little bit so you can reach see when I'm playing something stretchy I play it I, I put my hand so I can get down a little bit more like this and I can reach further, right? I can reach really far when I do this, right? I'm exaggerating. If I had my thumb up here, it wouldn't, I couldn't do it. It has to come down. Okay. Yeah, let's see. What else do we have for questions? A favorite looper that I use? Uh, you know, I probably should get a new looper pedal. I don't have a favorite one. The ones I have I don't like actually. I use the Line 6 ones and they work fine, but it's the, the issue is that the ones I have you, you can go between selecting tones and effects and then you have in order to get to the looping fe feature you need to hold down a button for like three seconds then it goes into looper mode and you can use the buttons for that purpose the problem is that when i'm playing live i i, I want to be able to just loop right away and then sometimes i oh i have to hold the button down three times and it just kind of throws me off a little bit so i am going to take a look at looper pedals and find one that's just do, does one thing well which is to loop i know the boss ones are pretty good um, 
there is uh, I was one that I was looking at the other day I forget the name of it but um, yeah there's lots of good looper pedals out there yeah so okay more questions uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. how do you develop phrases outside yeah that's a big that's a big topic too but the easy answer is you can play anything you just have to you have to just come back into the groove at the right time so uh, yeah I don't think I can take too much time on this it's, it's gonna be confusing but if I if I play uh, E minor I can start with the, the minor scale natural minor So what I was doing there, I just used an arpeggio from a different mode or scale. I played G melodic minor. Over E. Then I can come back in when I feel it's right in, in the song into back to the regular minor. So things like that, you you learn over time, analyze what other people are doing and um, watch more of my lessons maybe uh, when I talk about those things. But you can do almost anything. I can play the wrong scale. As long as I keep playing the, a line that comes back in inside again then it can sound cool so what I was doing there I played I just went a half step lower to E flat uh, minor pentatonic and back in then it sounds like oh that was kind of cool and it's just one concept Almost any concert will work as long as you come back in nicely. Okay. Um, yeah, John Highland, he's got fat fingers, and he sure can play. Yeah, I don't think fatness of your fingers really is a big deal. You just have to work with what you got and realize that if you put your hand in the right spot, you can reach really far. Um, So, next thing I want to tell you is technique. So, when you're practicing technique, if you already can play. I mean, do you need to be faster than that? If you feel like I, I want to play that faster, then you have to focus on fine-tuning that. I can't really play that very fast. So at, at, at a certain point, I'm going to be like, okay, this is about as fast, as fast as I can go without making a ton of mistakes. Then I might, I might stop there and focus on some other technique or find a different way of playing it because you can play pentatonic in this case this is just an example in more than this way where I use two notes per string you know you can play three for example and sometimes I can't play that really fast either I admit but can do stuff like that you know then I focus on making that sound good and I fine-tune it if I play sounds like sloppy okay that means I gotta fix that 
then I'm, and I focus on the little detail details of it. My weakness is what I'm focusing on. And I can pick or I can do pull-offs. And then I travel up and down the neck to find the next available notes and, and find a way to, to play at the speed at which I want to play, but doing it cleanly. And if, if I find certain spots are really difficult, then I find, I, I, then I try to fix that at, at that position or I find a different way of playing it. So that when I'm improvising or doing something, I'm not just stuck, stuck in one way of playing something. I have several ways and I can choose the one that I feel is best in the moment. So another thing you can run into is that your, your picking hand is like, oh, I, I'm not synchronized with my left hand. And that's very common and I have that problem too. Sometimes I can't play it cleanly. Especially that three notes per string thing, which is one reason why I don't do it all the time. But uh, you would have, in order to get better at that, and I really should do this too, is to spend more time fine tuning. You know, play faster and faster and try to make it clean and relaxed. And over time, I will get better at it. I will fine tune that technique so that I can use it more freely in my playing. But it, it just takes time and focused practice. But technique doesn't come overnight. Like if you want to be playing something that you can't do, you can't just, okay, I'm going to practice all day today and then I'll know it. It won't happen. You need, some techniques can take you years to develop. And, um, well, for sure, years. Like there's that alternate picking stuff fast and a lot of those complex sweep things. I can't do those. It'll take me years to to uh, get decent at, at those. But I don't feel like it's my thing, so I don't focus on that stuff so much. I, I'm just trying to find my own thing. So whatever technique I'm working on, I'm I'm starting. I find the starting point, what I can do, and then I fine tune everything slowly, carefully, methodically. I spend time with the drum machine, a back and track, metronome, and I take my time to really listen to what I'm doing. And if I get to a point where I can play this quite well, but it's not fast enough, for me, I usually don't care about that. I want to be able, able to play notes that sound, um, lines that sound good for what I do. And if it's not always fast, that's okay. Music is music. It doesn't have to be fast for it to be good. Um, but, and this is also individual, when I do want to play some fast things, I usually use pull-offs and hammer-offs because I can't play alternate picking that fast. So there are cer certain tempos for me are very challenging because uh, I can't always do what my head wants to do. Being my fingers like, oh, I, that's too advanced or, you know, I'm going to mess up and I do. so. You know, it's like with everything, you just have to practice more and get better at it. But I just use hammer-ons and pull-offs a lot more when I'm playing fast things. It's just a personal style. So I don't alternate pick primarily. I use hammer-ons and pull-offs more than alternate picking. I do a little bit of sweep sometimes. And, this, and here's an example. I, I play the same idea in different spots on the neck, different fingering, so I can find them. Right? 
that's another thing that is important to do. So fine-tune your technique and uh, be patient, work on those weaknesses and, and don't spend too much time on playing something that you already can do well. Because what's the point? You want to get better, you need to practice things that you're not great at. It's obvious, right? But a lot of people just keep playing the same stuff over and over and then, then they wonder why they don't get better. It's because they don't have, they don't take the time and the effort to work on things that are hard or harder. Maybe they're scared, like, oh, I can't do that, so I'm not going to try. Well, that's the wrong way of thinking. If you can't do something, uh, it really means you haven't tried hard enough. You haven't focused on it long enough. When I started running, I'm a distance runner, I wasn't very good. And I kept at it because I enjoyed it. And I realized I'm not so bad after all. And I started training more and more. And then I became really good, actually, eventually. So, you know, it's same with music. Okay. Almost done. Mm, more questions. Uh... Yeah, rhythmically, playing um, in the pocket rhythmically, you can play a lot of outside notes for sure. And usually the most important thing is to come back inside in a, in a proper way. That sounds like it was meant to be, melodically. I, I, tr I think of myself as a kind of a melodic player. I always think about chord notes and... able to find those sweet notes for me that's important all right how do I feel about the true fire learning style uh, well it's great they have all sorts of learning styles I mean they have tons of courses and material they're great uh, I think when it comes to courses and teaching and learning the most th important thing is that ideas and information can be explained and, and shown in a good way, but it also has to be fun and you want, you want to get that feeling like, oh, this is cool, I want to really want to learn this. And sometimes that can be an issue with something like theory. Like it's important, in my opinion, to know enough theory. And a lot of people are like, oh, there's nothing cool happening, I have to, you know, I guess I have to digest all this boring theoretical stuff I want to play. So there's always a balance between those things. You want to learn a bite size of theory and then apply it. Bite size, apply. And um, not every person learns the same way either. There's not one correct way to teach and one correct way to learn something. We're all different individuals and you have to find what works best for you and then you'll probably find teachers that um, are more in tune with your style of learning and what you what you appreciate uh, and need uh, in your learning environment if that makes sense so in the jam at true fire uh, I don't know they haven't uh, we haven't talked about that that would be cool to do something like that we'll see I'm gonna talk to true fire fairly soon I hope See if I can get something more going. Um, chord tone soling on rock chords. One, three, five, seven. Hey, Joe. Yeah, instead of just playing the pentatonic all through, you can you should definitely explore highlighting the chords. G. You know, you should definitely try to do that and just practice finding maybe the third for the first chord. Uh, for each chord, I mean. Mm. 
and then you find the um, I don't know root and, and third that wasn't the root and third of all of them <laughs> sorry uh, the root and the, the third and the fifth and the third and the root sometimes but you know I th I think a lot about triads when I play so uh, if you can find the one three five for all, all of those chords as they come by as you play something becomes very melodic right you don't always need to do that but you're throwing those types of ideas sometimes and then you're going you can do that kind of stuff just you know wanking around on the pentatonic and hang on a few notes but you can always come back to something sweet like that chord tone thing anywhere you like on, on any of the chords all right uh, well, I think we're almost done been an hour wow time goes fast and I have one more thing to say a tip uh, da, 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 uh, any last questions um, Yeah, too much theory is going to scare people away, and I tried to find a way to introduce it gradually in a way that makes it interesting. And and if you look at some of my short lessons, uh, if you check out my my two minute lessons, and actually anything that I have on my channel, when you see something like cool fusion lick or jazz blues lick or uh, outside um, ideas, blah blah blah, whatever I have take a moment to try and understand what's happening because that's really really important i don't know have i already talked about that uh no that's that's my next point the fifth point transcribe licks and lines and even chords anything musically really transcribe and when i say transcribe what i mean is not to uh write it down in notation and then never touch it you don't even have to to uh, write it down uh, but it's good if you do like something like guitar pro because it's quick and easy and then you'll remember it but what I'm talking about is transcribing some idea using your ear listening to you know it could be Hendrix or something and then you, you you try to understand what is what are those notes he's playing actually is it you know is the major pentatonic is it the melodic minor figure out what it is and you'll see that oh in this case okay it's just a minor pentatonic right and another time you might find that well let, let me show you a cool little idea that I learned yes last night I can't play it well yet but it sounds really cool it's something I transcribed and again, when I say, say, say transcribe, I mean I slow it down, I isolate, or I, I just loop that section, that lick or that line over and over, and I, I often just go one note at a time. Okay, he started with a triad. What happened after that? Sounds really cool, doesn't it? So what's happening? Then I then I start trying to understand it. Okay, we have a triad. That's fine. We can do that in any time. But then he goes to a, a, fl a flat five, and then the major seven, which is weird. Those two notes over a minor chord. That's weird, right? Then you think, okay, how that how's that working? Then you continue. 
that note, what do those three notes together after the triad? These two, three. What are those? Yeah, an E flat major triad. So now I have learned something. I can take the E major triad and then continue up, going up uh, a scale, if you call it that. I'm going, my, I'm going up with notes. E major triad and then E flat major triad. I can play it over ma uh, major or minor. But then I would start with a minor triad. Minor E, E minor triad. That's an example of how I sit down and learn this line because when, when he played it, um, Michael Brecker, forgot to mention who played it, I think. Michael Brecker, phenomenal player. He played that stuff so fast, like, oh, this sounds so cool, I want to figure that out. So I had to slow it down, note for note, and then I sit and realize, oh, this is what's happening. So what, what I have learned from this is when you play over an, a minor chord, you can go down a half step and play... Um, a major triad because that that last note is part of the e, of the minor chord this one is not it's a major seven so it could be melodic minor because those two notes are both part of e, e melodic minor or harmonic minor but this note it's just not supposed to be there so now I'm playing a scale that doesn't exist really but it's not the scale that I'm, I'm learning about I'm learning about triads right and it works with both major and minor uh, That's the line I came up with. Cool? Uh, cool? So that's an example of, I learned something. So now, I, anytime I have a minor, uh, let's say major, as I said, it can, they work over both actually. Let's say I play over an A major chord. I can use that same approach now. it sound outside and cool come back inside using triads one triad inside the next one is not inside all right i hope that makes sense those are the kind of things that i, I work on trying to learn for life you know it's not the lick itself it's like what makes this lick work why does it sound cool how can i use this concept again somehow that's what you should be doing when you're transcribing um so with that said, you need to find a way to slow things down or isolate things uh, so that you can process it easier with your brain. And I use a tool called Song Surgeon. I, there's a link here in the... Um, oh, I can actually paste it right in here, I think. Uh, there's a link through my website that takes you to Song, Song Surgeon. That It's not a free program, but I find it really helpful. There are other programs. There's one called Transcribe and there's uh, Riff master pro or something there's several of those things 
those kind of tools out there. But what they allow you to do is to narrow in on a certain line or lick, and then you can slow down the tempo while keeping the pitch. And that's really helpful, especially when you hear those fast sax players just go, and like, oh, I want to be able to figure out that stuff, but you can't hear it fast enough. All right. So slowing down is really, really beneficial. And um, as I said, as you get into playing that kind of idea that you then transcribed, you you put it, you write it down in your uh, step number one, tip number one. Keep it in your uh, lick lick diary, lick library, lick book, whatever you want to call it. And then you practice it frequently and make sure you understand the concept behind something like that, so that you can use those types of ideas again. Because just doing, being able to play one thing that's very isolated, you don't understand it, but you can only play it in one key because you, you remember the fingering and it sounds cool. You can throw it in now, one now and then. But if you don't really understand it, it's not as, well, it's more limited in use, right? Because you have to um, just remember fingers where they go. But if you understand the concept behind it, you can figure out your own fingering for things and, and alter that lick and take it other places because what I did with this one I came up with that because that fits my fingering something like that um, you know the same concept I just alter the fingering to fit my style of playing. Now maybe I can use it in a song. Maybe I can use it when I'm improvising, like, oh, I kind of throw in this cool, flashy Michael Brecker line that will may, may, maybe will impress people. Sounds cool. It's okay. So that's, those are five tips for you for how to, um, well, I we say how to get better, how to practice, how to get better, how to take your playing a step further and some of these things that I talked about, I realized they might be a little bit advanced. If you're a complete beginner, it might be a lot of information that, that you don't know how to use, but you just got to start somewhere. And as you get better, you can still apply these concepts. You can, you can transcribe just one note. And then uh, once you learn, um, once you find that, then you can... Maybe you hear B.B. King play that and you can't figure it out. You slow it down one note at a time You try and also try to imitate the rhythm. Da -da 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 -da. So you have that rhythm in your head and then you try to find the notes. Oh, that was wrong. That was also wrong. That's close. There it is. Found it. Eureka. Okay, that is all I had to say. Well, the final thing I want to say is there is not one single true proper way of doing anything. Experiment and trust your instincts and be happy. It's fun to play guitar and you just go for it. Okay, now, last few questions before I leave. That sir I have has stainless steel frets. Uh, does it? I have to think. Yeah, it does. It does have stainless steel frets. It was factory installed. Do they alter a pure strat tone much? I don't think so. I can't hear it. Maybe some people can. I don't have great hearing, but they last a long time and. Um, uh, they might, I, theoretically, I guess they might sound a little less vintagey, but I mean, we're talking about such small details that uh, it's going to be hard for most people to hear the difference. Okay, any more questions I got here? Da, 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 da. Rhythm with lead lines. Uh, that will be, I'll have to be for a different video. I don't have time to do more playing now, I think. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Hey, I love you too. 
Yeah, if you want my lessons, um, my website, Master Guitar Academy, there's a ton of stuff there and it always add new things and we have a great community there. So that's the best place to learn from me. Uh, if you want the cheaper option, YouTube uh, channel membership is where you get the tablature and jam track and notation for all these two minute lessons. And also when you're, when we're in chats like this, you can use your, um, your special emojis and you get, a, um, what's it called? Um, an avatar that changes over time. The more you, the longer you've been a member, uh, the more exclusive of an avatar you'll get in chats and things like this. Even when you're commenting on one of my videos. Uh, did I play major over Jimmy? Yeah, I guess I did. I don't know what I play. <laughs> I just play. Yeah, it's getting late here too. I'm going to close down and go to bed. But um, the five tips, Chris, are in the description of the video. I have them listed there so you can find them. Keep the licks and lines in a book or diary. And as long as when you learn new stuff, put write them down, put them in there. Number two is practicing scales all over the neck. Find fingerings that work for you. Don't just play in one position. Go up and down the neck and take your time. Work on timing. Play with the rhythm device, a, a drum groove, drum machine. It's a free one that I should put in the description there too. Where did it go? There we go. Drum bit. Uh, technique. Work on your weaknesses. Fine tune what you do. If you find something is really, really impossible to do, then you have to decide. Do you really want to spend all that much time to get better at it? Or do you, can you find a different way of playing it? And just fine tune the technique you have one little step at a time. Don't try and decide overnight I'm going to be the new Ingmar Malmsteen and then you just practice 10 hours a day for a week and think you got it. It probably won't work. Fine tune what you have in terms of technique. And then lastly, transcribe licks and lines, analyze what's happening, try to understand theoretically what's happening, try to understand how you can find these ideas in different keys and different spots on the neck so that you take advantage of having all these notes available to you and not get locked into a box. Those are my five tips. Yes. So, there we go. Uh, da, 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 da. Any last questions? I use uh, the, the strings that I use are. Um, I usually use the hell, hell parch strings, but uh, most, most, um, most strings sound the same to me. I don't really see the big difference. Um, although I don't like those coated strings; they feel hard to bend for some reason. The ones I've tried, it's like. I, my fingertips get more sore than usual when bending on those uh, coated ones. Um, but the gauge I'm using is 40, what is it? 10 to 46. 10 to 46, just yes, standard. Yeah. Okay, guys. Thank you so much. Gracias. Muchos gracias. And danke, Juan. And tak so mucho. And... Uh, I don't know any other languages. Merci beaucoup. There we go. All right, guys. Peace out. And um, remember, I have my new picks now for anyone who joins my website for a year. It's really cheap per day, but then you get these sent in the mail. Not the black one, though, because I don't know what I should do with these. They play, come up with some sort of board game with them because <laughs> the paint comes off. But the white ones are great. They're really awesome. Uh, oh, I just remembered. I was detached for a second. My microphone. I was going to grab a, a pack of strings to show you, but I, I can't reach or this will... 
the microphone will mess it up, but they are Kurt Mangan. Mangan? Kurt Mangan strings. They are also really nice. You should check them out. Kurt Mangan. M-A-N-G-A-N. I'll write that down. Kurt Mangan strings. Yeah, they're awesome too. I like those. So, good night guys. Peace and prosperity to you all. And we'll do this again next month in March. I'm glad to see so many here. I think it went pretty well. I have it, and this mic is new and it seems to have worked okay. And remember you can get shirts and stuff from my uh, merchandise store. These wonderful coffee mugs that makes your coffee taste so great. <laughs> Cafepress.ca slash Master Guitar Academy. There's a link in the, in the YouTube description too. Hmm. This is cold now. Oh well. We'll see you next time. Good night, guys. Take care.